This podcast is a quest for well-being, a quest for a meaningful life through the exploration of fundamental truths, enlightening ideas, insights on physical, mental, and spiritual health. The inspiration is love. The aspiration is to awaken new ways of thinking that can lead us to a new way of being, being well. Welcome to Body, Mind, and Soul Healing Conversations. Kristen believes in the healing power of authentic connection. She uses a down-to-earth, humorous approach to help others achieve the kind of change they are looking for. She offers practical tips to assist them in identifying and relieving root fears with the purpose of realigning their mind-body into its natural state of wellness. Through customized energy and shadow work, Kristen guides them to reprogram their nervous system, shed layers of negative thought, and realign their energy into its natural state of being. Over time, joy, curiosity, and play will once again become natural parts in her client's daily world, and living a life of personal empowerment will not only become possible, but a full-time experience. Valeria interviews Kristen Opris. She is a licensed clinical professional counselor. Kristen was born and raised in Northern Idaho. She is a small town girl with a big heart and a wild love for the world community. She identifies as a spiritual mystic, and she has, thus far, spent her life exploring the psychological catacombs of what it means to be human. Kristen obtained a BA in psychology in 2008 and an MA in clinical psychology in 2010. Over her 15 years of clinical counseling, she has worked in Chicago, inner city Detroit, and downtown Spokane. Kristen spent her time with the downtrodden, the overlooked, and the outcast all of which have taught her a great deal about what she believes it truly means to be human. Since the beginning of the pandemic, Kristen has taken what she learned from her counseling practice and worked to integrate it into a higher form of life coaching. She believes in the positive, growth-minded perspective that coaching offers, and she is excited to continue to help people evolve in their personal experience of getting to know who they are on a soulful level. Meet Kristen Opris at sacred-soul.clientsecure.me. Here's the interview with Kristen. In your own words, who is Kristen Opris? So Kristen Opris is here. I think that's something that... uh, So I've, I've been doing equine therapy with a good friend of mine for about a year, and he keeps on asking me, who are you? And, uh-huh. and, and I ask him the same question back, you know, who are you? His name is Jack, you know, who are you, Jack? And he talks about how he, he doesn't really know who he is as a person. And, and I, so I've struggled with that question too, of who am I? What I've come con- concluded and come to is that I believe that I am here. And in that, it seems so simple. And yet there's a lot of depth in it because what exactly does it mean to be here? And moment to moment, day to day, it looks something, it's a little different. So I think that's what I would have to start with. I am a creature some way, somehow in a whole bunch of different dimensions that is working on being collectively here. Mm, wow. How what can I say? <laughs> here. Yeah, the place less here. Right. Feels like a place. But when it comes from that understanding, I do a sense that it's just awareness itself. Mm. Kind of recognizing itself mm. being here, but there's no really definition, description for that here. It's just happening. This sounds, I have to say, very spiritual. And I do know that you do spiritual work. Mm-hmm. So even I love the, the title of your company is the Sacred Soul mm-hmm. Intuitive Counseling and Coaching. Mm-hmm. That caught my attention immediately. So I guess the follow-up question is, what is spirituality to you, Kristen? Mm-hmm. Spirituality is it's some level of experience or flow. It's So it's connected with the concept of being here, but allowing yourself to be as curious as you possibly can, 
with the intention of connection. And, and sometimes, at least in the past, I've been kind of aggressive in that, like mm-hmm. almost yeah. a little bit too intense because I love connection. I love connecting with people and animals and, and plants and, and different cultures. And there's so many different things to be able to connect with them. I mean, I could walk outside and I could sit with a plant for an hour Mm -hmm, and, and ask the plant to reveal itself (laughs) to me. And in that there can be really deep connection. Um, so it's, I think it's the, it's spirituality to me is the practice of really stepping into a moment and allowing time to either slow down or disappear in a way that you are no longer weighing or measuring the presence of your existence. You are just here. And then from there, flow will naturally take a hold of you and take relationships deeper. And it'll do it in a way that's not aggressive. And it's not, there's no conflict in it because there's just openness. Mm, Yes. Uh, a billion times yes to that truth yes it sounds like the idea of yoga union which Mm. is also I'm a student of Vedanta Advaita Vedanta Mm -hmm. I don't know if you heard about non-duality a lot of people have I have you have right so they talk a lot about this state of union with everything there is and basically that uh, pure consciousness it's not in things and object, objects, but everything is in it. Mm-hmm. Every time I reflect on this understanding, it's a concept. It has become less and less abstract for me from that broad, large, I mean, amazing view. Mm-hmm. But then, you know, coming down <laughs> from that mountain to the day-to-day human experience, it's interesting to notice how slow it gets, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? To integrate mm-hmm. those truths. Is that something that you also kind of dance around with your clients and mm-hmm. yourself? Mm-hmm. Well, I first and foremost <laughs> dance around with it with myself. Because <laughs> yes. anything that I ask my clients to do, it's something that either I'm working through currently or something that I have worked through well enough in the past to be able to explain and break it down in common language. Because that's what I think is so helpful with with counseling or coaching is to work with somebody who's lived it so then they can break the experience down into a language that that feels very customized and adaptable to each person. And so it's I, I'm just exploring as I go and I'm learning what it means daily, hourly, sometimes by the minute, what it means to slow down and be present. And what I've noticed, especially over the last couple of years, is how much natural resistance there is in my physical body. My, my body goes the route of productivity and and it is in this place where it wants to weigh and measure productivity in so many different, uh, I mean, so many different ways. But really, what I'm, what my soul is wanting, what my heart is wanting, what my entire being is wanting to is to be able to just take a breath, settle in the moment, connect with whatever is present, allow there to be an exchange of information. And that's something that I do with my clients: is that when I'm present with them, I'm teaching them something, sure but I'm also actively learning something. So there's this energetic exchange that goes back and forth and I'm absorbing something really valuable from them that um, I'll then be able to use moving forward with the other people that I connect with. And so it's this learning experience as much as it's also a teaching experience. And that to me is what makes life so much fun. Cause I feel like I am, I, as much as I aspire to be a master in some regard, I don't think you ever fully get to master spirituality because you're always a student. And, and that, that is, once I think you connect with the master student relationship within your own self, all of a sudden play starts becoming a very real part of your life again. And you as an adult, you get to play with mm. everything. And that mm. is so much fun. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. And, and I think that's what is just making an observation. I think when it comes to spirituality, there's so much seriousness around it, mm. right? <laughs> Spiritual settings too and much. ceremonies. Yeah, too, much, too much. Right? And, and playfulness. There's something about the word Play in light, you know, even we use that as an expression, I guess, you know, lighten up. So light and playfulness, they go hand in hand. I really 
think that that's needed too. I know that it takes the recognition of interconnectedness of everything that you have had from, you sound very much and feels that way, the, the energy that resonates from you, just knowing that everything is connected. And actually going deeper than that, it's actually there's just one reality that holds all this together. Mm-hmm. So once we know that, it just, I don't know, something, I think the idea of knowledge even kind of, it dissolves, you know, what what is here to know once you know that? What else to know? What's more important than than that. Another question for you. I mean, this is, has to do with the topic, which is mm-hmm. being bolded by love. So the question that came to me immediately was love. <laughs> what is your understanding of love, Kristen? <laughs> so I think it's multidimensional just as being human is multidimensional. And, and that's where we can continue to explore. Because I do believe that we as humans, who we are, we are explorers currently caught in cycles of survival. So we're kind of distracted by survival and what falls by the wayside is our ability to be able to connect. In the midst of survival, everything else goes out the window and we descend into a place of stress and we're not able to connect in ways that are then energetically fulfilling. And I think what feels ironic to me is uh, is that if we first stop and connect with ourselves and then gently connect with those around us, then survival not only, I mean, becomes easier, but I think it becomes a non-issue because it's within the spirit of very deep and safe connection. We feel that fulfilled sense of love. That to me is what love is. Because people talk a lot about how love is an act and it's a choice. And that is true, that there is, it is an action and it is a choice. You can decide to love people, but it is also a feeling. Love really is a feeling. And I think that's something that kind of gets dismissed um, culturally because it seems so light and trivial. People like to say, you know, no, like it's a feeling in the honeymoon stage and then that goes away and then it's a choice from that point forward. And then it's just a grind for the rest of your life. And that's (laughs) love. And I (laughs) I disagree. I disagree. I think it is is a choice and sometimes it is hard and it is challenging. But I think when love is really present – and you are in the flow of love, then choices become very easy because you feel a sense of love. I know I actually, I'll feel it in my nervous system and it will start either in the middle of my chest or or down kind of around my, I mean, or, or it'll be around my, my pelvic area, around my bowels. And so that, that sensation, it's a physical sense of, of energy and lightness and excitement and wholeness and safety that I feel very safe in somebody else's presence or in my own presence when I feel really connected to myself. And then that, that sensation will blossom slowly with this really powerful warmth all the way through my nervous system the longer that I sit in that experience of love. And so, and that's what I really enjoy teaching people is how to be able to open up their nervous systems to really feel a full circuit of love within themselves so then they can acclimate their nervous system to the, to the feeling. And over time, it's, it's like, it's like, um, toning your palate. You're getting better and better at actually being able to recognize when you feel loved. And the more you're tuned to that, the more you'll gravitate towards situations that bring that out in you. And the more you practice it, the better you get. And then the the more whole holistic and healthy relationships you'll be able to have with other people. Because the moment that that physical feeling disappears, that is telling you something. And it's it's a message and you want to be able to hear the message and then make a conscious decision about how to be able to move forward in a way that is self-respecting, but also respecting of your environment and the people in it. So the feeling is important. Yes, yes, I absolutely agree. I could not trust my feelings for a long time because of trauma, mm-hmm. but even my intuition, are they different? How do we learn to distinguish between intuition and those feelings that you speak of. Because I'm not even sure if I know straight off the bat, like what exactly that is. It's a type of question that I have to let marinate for a moment because I think they, they are, they overlap in a way that it's a little bit enmeshed. Cause I know that that's, 
that's how I experienced it in the past too, that in my mind, my emotions were my intuition. But there's something about intuition that I think is, it is a, it's a deeper sensation and it tends to be really quiet. Um, something that, because so I was I was raised in a very conservative form of evangelical Christianity, so I know I know the Bible in and out because it was it was something that uh, I was so accustomed to hearing. And something that has always stood out to me is that within the Bible they talk about that still small voice that that is the voice of God, and that is what I equate intuition with: is that when you slow everything down and you're not experiencing big, powerful loud, intense emotions, but you, you're you able to move all of that out of the way and you move deeper, especially in your nervous system. That's why when I really connect with that sense of love, it kind of originates in my root chakra, like deep down in my pelvis. And, and it feels like this very small, but confident, loving voice. And that it, it's not aggressive, but it is powerful. And that I think is what intuition actually is. And as that speaks more and more to who you are, then it starts to inform your bigger, louder emotions. And then I think you can trust those bigger, louder emotions more because you're not just reacting out of it. It, it, it feels more stable and secure and more like it's yours. Mm, yes, that really resonates true. Although I will try to clarify a little bit more. So feelings and emotions, are they the same? Do you see them as the same thing? Do they have the same nature? So at this point, I would say yes, only in the sense that, well, the physical, so the physical, well, okay. All right. Now that I say this out loud, maybe I do see them as different. So I think feelings are a physical sensation in the body. It's a physical sensation in the nervous system. Emotions, I would equate it more to a psychological experience of that feeling. And so the emotion itself is something that we we, ex, we experience some kind of pain or torment or, or euphoria based on the physical sensation of it. And then with the emotion, we then decide that there's some kind of a meaning. And so I think the two are very much interconnected and related to one another. But yeah, I suppose I would say that they are different, that one is purely physical and the other is more psychological in nature. And it's the psychological part. That's where we can step into that and we can distinguish, you know, was there trauma here around your experience with feelings in the past? And maybe you're misinterpreting the psychological experience of that feeling. And so the emotion is where we can do some restructuring and and work to find more alignment in that. So then from there, your feelings are no longer scary. You don't have to be concerned or afraid of them and you can trust them to inform you correctly. Yes, that also very much resonates with me. I have heard from somebody that I interviewed a long ago and that's exactly how she explained. Mm. And that makes so much sense. And that's why one of my platforms, the video one for interviews, is called mm-hmm. The Freedom to Feel. And I didn't have the freedom to have emotions. <laughs> I didn't phrase it that way. So it was being okay, free to let the feelings come and go. It came from that understanding, probably. So that resonates. Thank you for answering that question, Kristen. It was out of the blue. But there's another question I want to ask that I have been asking other people and myself, actually, too. I'm trying to understand the difference between the subconscious mind and the unconscious mind. Mm. Any ideas? <laughs> <laughs> That's going deeper a little bit on mm-hmm. those realms. Mm-hmm. So the the subconscious, I view that as... It's that is the physical body, that the body itself harbors thoughts and memories and emotions that uh, some of them we're able to recall, that we can pull them back up and we're comfortable enough with the memory of it, that we can feel the physical sensation of where that's where that's been held in our physical bodies. And then we can kind of relive the memory or the emotion and work through it. But some of the those memories we view as inappropriate or uncomfortable, or there's too much pain into in it. So then we take the energy of it and we'll stuff it somewhere in our physical body and we'll hold it there. And that's where we start to often see imbalances in our overall health and then even manifestations of physical illness because it becomes stagnant energy within the subconscious, which again, to me, that is 
it's just it's just the actual physical body. So in and then in my mind, the unconscious is that is everything else. It's everything spiritual that is connected with the universe as a whole. So it's not just the interconnection of our species and and other species around us. It's the entirety of the universe of parts of the universe that are still a mystery and we have yet to explore. So I believe that the unconscious is accessible. And in fact, I think it wants to be known because there's this, it just feels like this really seductive romantic dance between us as these these explorers of consciousness and the rest of the universe is kind of tantalizing and seductive and gorgeous. And she just looks at us and goes, don't you want to know more? And we go, Oh, of course we do. (laughs) Of course we want to know more about who and what you are. But, but right now I think that exploration of the universe feels very hostile, almost as though that we reach out to connect deeper with the unconscious and then we get our hands slapped. So we pull away and then we don't really want that connection. And, and that is where like you've used the word dance and it is, it's just such a dance of us learning how to be able to be um, open and exploratory, but so respectful of whatever treasures are harbored within the unknown and the unconscious of the universe, because as we continue to be respectful and allow the universe to expose herself in a way that's consensual to her, then from there, I think that, um, I mean, it's, I think she just gives us these really treasured gifts and she does it out of the goodness of, of just who and what she is out of this place of abundance and wholeness and authenticity. And when we can receive it in that same spirit, we grow like crazy so, yeah. Another amazing answer, beautiful answer coming from you. Yes. Maybe I would phrase it a bit differently, but that's it. I think I wanted to make an observation about the idea of the unconscious. My experience has been that it's always here. Of course, it's mm. always present. It's not, it's not hidden and it's not trying to hide itself. There's a lot of, I would say, it's almost like gates and guard, guards trying to distract us, not on purpose, of course, you could say that that is the subconscious mind with all its Mm -hmm. complexities. And it's so easy. It's almost like trying to get somewhere. But then along the way, we just even forget where we were headed to because there's so many other things (laughs) that we get distracted by. That's what it feels like to me. Uh, yeah, it's true. It is true. And maybe that's why meditation is such a wonderful tool. And what you said earlier about slowing down, that's what meditation does, quieting the mind enough to just kind of open up. But even then, I have tried doing that. And some people do even psychedelics. They have different mm-hmm. kinds of ways of, of getting the, the unconscious, which to me is just the ultimate reality. That would mm-hmm. be that reality, that essence. That is nothing changed. It's always the same. So, yeah, psychedelics. I had an experience before myself. It was Ooh. involuntary. It was not really that I, I was trying to do that. But I noticed how much was revealed in that experience and how mm. painful it was to mm. see it. So I guess also there's something about trying to get there in that, in that way to that destination, which is not a, a destination. It's always here anyway. But some of us just turn back. It's just, it's so painful sometimes <laughs> to see the truth about the, the subconscious and how much it has done, even in different lifetimes. Or mm. they, We just tend to turn back. And I have heard that way from Vedanta, that is not just for the fainted of hearts, not for the weak hearted one. You have mm. only the, uh, it's not even the strongest. It's not, it's, you have to be almost in such a deep search for truth. I mean, that's the only thing really, it has to be the only thing that drives you in order for you to continue on that journey. <laughs> Isn't, I don't know if that makes sense to you, but no, it does. No, it's, it's, well, it's something that, I mean, my, my spouse, sometimes he looks at me like I'm a little bit crazy because that is my passion. And, and it, well, and it's that pursuit of truth. It informs me a little bit different every day. So I never entirely know what I'm going to be doing day to day because I'm following that intuition. I'm following that deep sense of consciousness within and, and it's not exactly that it changes, but it does evolve. 
because there's consistency in how it speaks. And yet the way in which I experience it, like the evolution of it, it gets bigger and bigger. And it asks me to do more and more that sometimes can feel really terrifying because uh, it's asking me to get to know myself better and deeper and wider. So then I can, I mean, so that that can be shared with others when it's appropriate to do so. And there's times when I don't feel ready to do that exploration for, you know, a number of reasons. And then revisiting that, that resistance, like you said, almost like those guards that are in place, almost like a parental control, like it's there and it's, it's giving you these limitations that sometimes is for your own safety because you need to venture into it gently, but you don't want it to be that hard, wall where it feels like it's saying you can't ever go here instead sometimes it might just be a let's slow down let's slow down and work through this gradually because it's such a big thing that to clear that energy inside of you just might just take a a gentle hand Mm, yes I, i love the approach of kindness right and being gentle with it I know that sometimes it's just not, (laughs) it's not the, for some of us, I guess, it's such a deep and powerful calling that we can't really choose (laughs) how it will unfold, gentle or abruptly. It just happens. In my case, we're just like this. I interviewed somebody who said the other day, you know, she did ayahuasca three times and she said it was almost like ripping the bandaid altogether. And that was needed for her. Like she wanted to see the truth, the revelations to come just at once. She didn't want it to be gradual for that experience, one of them. So I guess it might be for some of us, might be um, a calling or some, I don't know. I don't know what else to call. It might be. That's a good word. It is. It's, it's a good word. Yeah. A calling. Going back to um, uh, the, the topic, beautiful topic of it, be emboldened by love. So I guess the question that came to me, well, it came to me just when you were explaining what love is, what's the role of healing when it comes to exploring and experiencing that place of love that you call feeling safe within? Mm-hmm. So, so I'll just say what healing has meant for me personally, especially lately, that it is when I meditate, I'll go deep inside my subconscious, deep inside of my body, and I'll connect with different body parts and allow them to speak. So sometimes I'll let, if I'm feeling a pain in my hips, then I'll connect with that. And then there's a voice that comes out of it. Or lately I've, I've had a lot of stagnation in my liver. And so just allowing that to, that pain to be able to have a voice and for me to approach it with compassion and understanding where I don't have to take to heart everything that it says, because sometimes it says some pretty cruel things, but that the pain is needing to be heard so that the body part itself can really release that. And, uh, and so the more I connect with that, the, the physical sensations of things, the deeper it takes me into what feels like sometimes my genetic history. And, and lately I've been having a lot of memories that don't necessarily feel like my memories, but they're body memories um, from my paternal grandmother. So coming from my dad's side, that she was a woman who experienced a lot of neglect in her life and uh, that she didn't get the kind of physical connection that she really needed in order to feel rooted and safe in her body. And so in that, her memories feel as though that they're almost my memories in my body. So as much as her memories and her energy, it's not my job to to you know live her life and clear her story but there's something about the vibrational dysfunction and the suffering that she endured that somehow made it all the way through into my body and it's there and and so to feel that and to hear her voice coming out in the pain in my body and to just give it that space and that time and to approach it with such compassion and such gratitude that I'm so grateful for who she was as a woman and the things that she endured and went through so that she could make my dad so that he could make me. And then I have this wonderful opportunity to be here. So to to clear that energy and that pain, it almost feels like a privilege to be able to do it. 
because it's it, it it does feel as though that it then steps back into time and it somehow it, it creates a balance. And it's not that it totally rectifies it or erases the fact that she experienced that disconnect or that hardship, but it's but there is almost this connection then of souls because she's no longer living. And but I sense her. I sense her and I feel her and she feels very alive in me and with me. And so the more time I spend with that physical pain in my body, allowing it to speak, giving it that safety, then the more and more the pain dissipates, it disappears, and then it clears itself from my body. And at the moment, I have a fair amount of a physical pain here and there. And I think the challenge is to not get overwhelmed by it and to just throw in the towel and be like, well, I guess that's that. And the physical pain wins. Instead, it's more just an indicator of, no, you have become a safe enough person that now is the time where it gets to speak. So it's coming out all at once, but it's like a whole bunch of little children that have never had the nourishment that they've really needed. And they're coming to me asking for that attention and that care. And, and I love giving it to it and and letting that become this holistic thing. Ah, wow. That sounds like ancestral healing, you think I have heard. Yeah, that it, which is very real. I know some of us tend to not even listen to, to this conversation. They would they would not understand. Some of us cannot understand <laughs> that, but it it is it is very much real in the realm of the human experience, right? Mm-hmm. The interconnectedness mm-hmm. never goes away. How amazing. I love your perspective of healing. That's a very deep one in a sense of roots, right? Going back Mm -hmm. and just tracing Mm -hmm. back the subconscious mind, as you explained. So that goes very deep and it's interconnected with everything that has the body has experienced. So the body has become it in a way. How that's even more fascinating the way you explain that. So this is the the connection you make between the way you are healing and the way you are exploring the the realm of love, right? Mm-hmm. The way you, ex- you 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 understand it, right, mm-hmm. Kristen? How wonderful! Yes, you kind of paused me on that because I can never find the eye. <laughs> Probably have heard that before. It's interesting to see when we go deep enough into meditation or the realization of what we are, then we kind of see that there's no really fixed anything there. Mm. You can't find, an, um, you know, this complete entity called Valeria or called Kristen. It's just a combination of everything that has been, that is and will be. So it's not it's not one thing, it's everything. I love the way you, you explained that. Um, I, I kind of brought that reflection back of no fixed self. Mm. Would you like to make a comment on that? And that's what you call the being a human to be a human. Is that mm-hmm. I know that's a question that was raised to one of your guided <laughs> questions. I'm looking at it and trying to connect mm-hmm. here with this. It might be connected too, right, Kristen, with this idea of no. Well, it, the, yeah, the idea of no fixed self. And and because I, I really do believe that that who we are as humans, we are just meant to be explorers. And and the way that we've done that, that we've done exploring so far is we've done it with a fair amount of curiosity, but we have struggled to be able to do so with consent. And so we can be very bombarding in our exploration. And um, we've had, I mean, as far as the world empire goes, I would say that there's been a lot of success just as far as progress and being able to build up materialistic things in that spirit. But that's where if we integrate, I think a softer, uh, more feminine version of exploration, then it's then consent becomes a very real part of that exploration. And I think that that then softens the experience of emotional and physical and psychological intimacy. So then intimacy becomes much more pleasurable and a lot less threatening. And and so I think we as humans, we're just really starting to get the opportunity to go deeper inside of ourselves and find the wealth that's in there and allow it to blossom out into our physical realm and our connections with one another. Um, But I mean, it's, 
I believe that we are a very powerful species that is just beginning to really know and understand the depths of what that means. Um, I do believe that he, there have been humans in the past who have been able to approach us and connect with it, but it's been difficult for us to be able to find stability in this kind of depth. And and I'm hopeful that that's something that we can collectively do now, like one big group project of us coming together and learning how to be able to explore with a like-minded spirit of, of curiosity and, and respect for consent. And that's even consent within ourselves, because if we find that resistance within us, we don't want to go at it with a battering ram. We want to be really gentle and respectful and recognize that maybe now is not the time for us to go deeper there. Maybe it just means we have to pull back for a time and, and allow that part of us to soften until it's ready to connect. And the more we do that with ourselves, I think the more we'll be able to practice that with one another, because I do believe that we we, as a human race, we are one organism, and for some reason, we spend the majority of our energy at odds with each other. That we are, a, we're very, we are very angry with ourselves, and we're very upset, and we like to hurt ourselves in a way that it almost seems, it almost at times seems impossible to stop, that we can't help but just hurt ourselves because there's something there in that, that we get we get something out of it. And we do it over and over and over again. And so all of this energy that we have that could be devoted to exploring our wider environment, both internal and external, instead it just comes back to pouring that energy into hurting one another and therefore hurting ourselves. And it's just, it's, it's, it's a hard thing. It's a hard thing. And we all do it. I do it. I'm not in any way innocent of this. I, I too struggle with that, with that sensation of inner conflict. And I actually think that's, that's the benefit is the fact that I am so wildly and totally human. I get to go deep inside of this and, and experience that sense of wrestling but then let the wrestling soften into a place of presence. So then there's no longer fight. There's no longer fight or flight. There's just being. And then from there, intimacy becomes this natural flow. And it's so easy. Then you don't have to fight yourself. And, and in, intimacy becomes fun. Mm, oh, wow. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, a billion times to that, too. So the I call it harmony, right? That's mm -hmm. um, I I usually use the word peace, but harmony. There's something about harmony that um, speaks to what you're saying, which is more about um, ending the inner conflict, um, which is basically the relationship with the parts, right, in us, all the voices in us. Which I don't I don't see the fixed self, but so I see all those parts. So. So we can do that on the outside as well. And um, and I love the way you say that, the message of doing it gently, being kind. That's one of my, uh, one of my hi highest, let's say, if there was a behavior, <laughs> a, a guideline for behavior in a spiritual sense would be kindness. So I'm always very aware of that. Even when I'm not kind to myself or others around me, which doesn't happen too often. But I'm aware. And I think that's another powerful tool, right, Kristen, to be aware of the, those dynamics, you know, this movement. There's something here that watches, that knows what's happening. So it's not really going by, just happening as a reaction. So, yeah, harmony. That's my definition for harmony. It's really kind of being gentle enough, kind enough to be able to almost being okay with the par paradox, with the chains, with the, the differences, with the violence, everything mm. that's happening, mm -hmm. isn't it? And it's not be okay in a sense of accepting or this, I don't know, this sensation, this feeling that's, that's right. It has nothing to do with right or wrong, but there's a level of holding those energies sacred as mm. well. There's nothing that's not sacred to me. So I'm always looking from that perspective. And I, I know that there are parts of me that rejects that. <laughs> it wants to fight back and do something about it. <laughs> but then there's something else here that kind of overrides all that. So mm -hmm. ah, it's okay. <laughs> that is powerful because it 
on some level, it is okay. And that's where being a multidimensional being, you're able to recognize that there are there are maybe lower levels to who you are as a person where you feel that inner sense of conflict and you reject the those energies of violence and conflict. Um, but then as you move higher or into different dimensional parts of your being, you recognize that on some, there is a perspective where not only is it okay, but there's a wider understanding of wholeness and in, and in that there's, it becomes transcendent. You're able to transcend that that binary perspective, and and in that you'll find a deep sense of rest. And then you start to rest into that, and there comes the harmony and the peace and the connection and the wholeness. And the more you're able to practice being in that state, I think the easier it becomes to then go to the lower dimensional levels of who you are as a person, and and integrate that sense of this is uh, that sense of acceptance there. And, and then it starts becoming your inner, your different dimensional selves start to become interconnected. And there's an understanding that no dimension is without a voice, that each one is you. And even though, I mean, I may speak the language of higher and lower self, there is no such thing as more or less when it comes to yourself. So you might be in a lower dimensional state, feeling more aggravation, but that's still wholly and entirely you. And that part of you is absolutely worthy of love and attention and respect and and a certain platform to be heard. Uh, And it's a matter of being able to find the right platform for that to be able to be held and and then that is to me that's the idea of being emboldened by love is that when you are in a space where you are held and you feel truly safe then from there you will feel the sense the surge of love inside of you that will embolden you to move forward and all of a sudden growth not only becomes possible but it becomes the exact thing that you want to do. And every part of you will then embrace that experience of growth and you surge forward with with excitement and pleasure and joy. And then these lower sense of selves, uh, they become whole. They become a whole part of everything else. And and then again, it's it just starts becoming fun because then you want to connect with your lower self. You don't want to just ignore it. You want to do it and you want to go there because you get this experience of, of, of learning how to be able to love yourself deeper and wider. And it's just so much fun. Mm, yes. <laughs> yes. That's so, so true. I love how clear you are, Kristen, explaining all this. Yes. And I know it sounds paradoxical sometimes. Mm. I don't, I actually don't see this as a paradox, but it's exactly as you said. It's just when I said it's okay to let those energies or the lower reality to be here, to mm-hmm. also to be. Mm-hmm. So there's no rejecting, pushing away, because it's the identification of consciousness itself, right? Like you, you said, of what we are. That's our essence, being identified with certain things. Some, some, some of us are identified with the physical body, and we do believe that's all we are. Some mm. people with the mind, they think that that's all we are as well. But then some of us who have realized that we are we are not the mind, body, and mind. <laughs> we are none of this. We're just everything, mm-hmm. Huh? Mm-hmm. right? Just everything. And that's going deeper and deeper and deeper. What's not to love about it? That's what I usually say. What's not to love about mm. the courage, the openness, just to go deeper. I, I think about the ocean. <laughs> Every mm. time I think about this, you know, walk the amazing things that we can find there if we just had the courage to just mm-hmm. dive deeper. Ah, so we're almost at the end. I do have the ending questions for you. But before that, I know there's a guided question here that I didn't ask about why have you moved away from clinical diagnosis mm. as a form of mental care? <laughs> that I had to ask. <laughs> <This Okay. question. laughs> well, I could talk about that for hours. Try yeah, to keep I, I can't imagine, right. Um, so I, I found myself, so after 15 years of working in the clinical realm, Um, specializing and focusing on trauma, I started finding myself getting really, really frustrated 
by clinical diagnosis because it started to feel as though that I was fighting against it when it came to the experience of healing. And, and that's only just in, so in my observations of how the subconscious works with how the body works when it comes to healing, when you tell the mind something, you plant a seed inside of it, especially when you plant that seed in a state of love. And, and so if you tell the mind that it is ill, the body will believe it. And that's what I kept on seeing over and over again. And so initially people would come into my practice and I would, you know, diagnose them with depression or anxiety or you know, maybe a personality disorder or something more extreme. And, and initially there would be some level of relief in that. They would be like, oh, good, there's a name for this. I'm so thankful that there's a sense of understanding. And, and what I found over time is that the label started becoming more problematic and I'd have to fight against it. So what I, what I kind of came to, and I'm still playing around with this because I have respect for, for the, the clinical realm and the experience of diagnosis and where that really comes from and the history there. And I want to be respectful of that, not just throw it out completely. Um, but what feels more important to me is just the presence between the clinician and the individual that you're working with. That as long as there's a sense of understanding that the, the clinician understands where the client is going and what they're talking about, then in my mind, there's no need for diagnosis because then we step in with much more of what would be a shamanic mindset or more traditionally a shamanic mindset. And we're looking more for energetic imbalance. So we're not looking for something rigid or specific. We're not looking for a whole bunch of symptoms in order, order to label it with a very rigid understanding of an illness because we don't want to tell the body that it's ill, but we can have an understanding that there is some kind of imbalance there because maybe there's some kind of energetic stagnation or maybe the person is needing to grow into more holistically of who they are as a person, but their environment won't really allow that. So we need to move some things around in their environment. And as soon as that happens, because uh, it just feels like transport, like transplanting a, a plant into a bigger pot that that when it has the room to grow, it just will grow. And the experience of diagnosis itself, it st started to feel as though that it was keeping people in pots too small and they weren't able to fully transition out of that because the medical model was just too intense. So even so, even within the practice that I do now, as, as odd as this may seem, I only accept private play, pay. I don't accept insurance for the very specific reason of when we utilize insurance, there is somewhere deep within our subconscious, there's a sense of gratitude that we have insurance to be able to cover it. But there's still this implication that because it's insurance and it's tied to the medical system, it still implies to the body that it's ill. And then you end up countering that. And so what I've experienced is, is that with people paying out of pocket, as difficult as that may be, they're more invested in the care and treatment. And then from there, we can move outside the traditional medical model and the body responds faster to healing. And so it feels so much more efficient to me to be able to stay outside the realm of diagnosis and just the medical system itself and allow the person to fully take charge, allow their body to take charge of their own healing in a way that progressively over time, they start to see really fast effects, that they start feeling a sense of confidence on a physical level, that they can trust their bodies to heal themselves in the sense of correcting those imbalances rather than getting stuck in a diagnosis that loops around in their subconscious for years. Because that's what I don't like seeing is, is working with somebody who clinically could be considered, let's, for example, just say that they're clinically depressed and, but then they end up fighting what the, the cultural understanding of depression is in their body versus when we just take that out completely. And then we look at the person fresh, you know, their energy and customize it to who they are as an individual and their environment. Then all of a sudden there's just this surge. It's almost like this life force surge that runs through the body. It renews the nervous system. People start to heal and then they'll find their own balance. So that's, that's the reason why I've been leaning further away from clinical diagnosis. And, and so far I've had a lot of success with it. And it's, and I think what feels so great about it is that there's a sense of freshness that comes with it. So now we have room to play. We have room to play and explore because we're not so boxed in by, um, 
by the medical model of what we are and aren't allowed to explore. And, and it's that play that yet again, once you integrate that, it gives a surge of life force energy that seems to heal the body faster. Wow, I'm so glad you've done this. I know that it takes courage too, because now you're moving also from survival to the, the transcendence of that. Uh, it's not just about survival, making money, but helping others. How, how effectively, how can I help in a more effective way? And it's mm -hmm. not just effective, but it sounds to me in the way you, you speak, it's natural. There's a sense of mm -hmm. freedom in it. That's what we are, isn't it? Our essence is free. <laughs> so we got to tap into freedom mm -hmm. in order to heal whatever it is. I absolutely love everything about you, Kristen. It's so Thank you. open, spacious, it's wise, it's loving, kind. I mean, all of these amazing qualities I, I, I was able to sense uh, throughout this interview. So, and before even we will be recorded. So that's how embodied <laughs> you are with your own mm. truth, the truth that you have found. So thank you so much for being you. Thank you. And before we say goodbye, I'm, I wish I could stay here. I mean, I could <laughs> or literally stay for hours, ages <laughs> speaking <laughs> with you about these things. But for the sake of going back to structured reality. So let me ask you the ending questions and then the technical one. So let's see. I'll ask you. Yeah, I'll ask you this question. <laughs> uh, what do you love most about being also the body? Like what is about the body that you really appreciate and enjoy? Mm -hmm. Mm. So that has been so far a lifelong experience that when I was a kid, I was, I, I was, I had physical illnesses that really disconnected and dissociated me from my body. So I would just disconnect and kind of go into that ethereal space in my mind. And I think it felt very spiritual because I wanted to avoid what felt like painful experiences in the body. But as I've gotten older and I've pursued healing deeper and deeper within my own self, I've realized that to me, at least the, the highest form, I think the highest form of spirituality for me at this point is to be fully myself and fully connected to my body, even though I want to avoid it and kind of jump out of it because there's so much, it feels like so much physical pain there. Um, but the body is such a powerful place to be because of its vulnerability. I think it is the portal for connection and so when we disconnect from it, we are we are disconnecting from everything rich that can be provided in this life. And I think that the body holds, I think it holistically holds um, the truth to its own healing. I think it's 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 there's so much ancient wisdom in it that when we trust it and we get out of our headspace and stop trying to control it, it will heal itself in ways that I, I think not just feel, but are miraculous. And, and that, I mean, again, it just feels entirely spiritual because there's, there's an energy beyond me, beyond us, beyond anything that I can consciously understand or explain. But there is this wild energy that is so powerful and loving that it will run right through the body and the body just drinks it up. And so it's, I mean, the, the body, I think, is our most powerful tool. And yet we have a tendency to use it and abuse it and throw it away um, almost as though like we're neglecting or abusing a child because it, it is a very vulnerable, it's a vulnerable part of who we are and the most vulnerable part of who we are. And so, but that continues to be a journey that I, uh, I'm on is is allowing my own sense of self, my spirit, my being to be present within my body and then to allow my body to move forward in its infinite wisdom and do exactly the kind of work that the universe would ask it to do. And it requires openness on all levels of who I am, but then the body itself ends up being, it's that portal for connection. It's the one that moves it forward. And so it's it's so needed in everything that we do spiritually. 
And because it's not just a temple, it is us. We are the body. It's, it's some way, somehow it, we begin and we end here within this spiritual experience of existence here in the body. And, and I do believe that there was more before we were incarnated and more that comes after. But in many ways, I don't think it matters. I think what matters is our experience in the flesh and blood here and now in that vulnerability. There's a lot of power in it. Yes. Um, wow, again, I'm like, gosh, you said so many things that have was like, you just topped me. One of the things that really um, um, kind of made me speechless without speaking <laughs> was uh, when you said about the body being a child. Yes, mm. that's what came to me through a meditation. And that was mm. the insight, I remember. Mm. It's like a baby. How would you treat mm -hmm. a baby? That's mm -hmm. your body. Wow. When you think about how many of us abuse the body. It's just sad. It's really sad to even to talk about it. Uh, the energy of that is very sad. Mm -hmm. A lot of rejection. There's a lot of abuse. And then for some reason, we are surprised that and then when children are abused, well, we have been abusing our own bodies. So <laughs> we're just passing that on as a legacy. Uh, that's the reflection of that. I actually think there's a lot of truth in that because it's not it's not too far of a jump to go from one to the other. When we disrespect the innocence of the vulnerability of our body, it makes sense that we then transition that to those that are physically in the same position um, within our intimate circles. And so then, because we just disrespect it. And so we disrespect them. Right. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, oh my God, Chris, this is another topic for another podcast conversation. For sure, <laughs> will be a whole conversation about that. <laughs> but my last question to you is what three experiences you wish everyone to have before they lose the body, before they die? So good questions. They're just so good. Um, oh, man. Well, that one kind of caught me off guard. Let's see. Well, I think the first thing that comes to mind is being able to fully explore and flesh out your sexual sense of self. I think that a lot of us get stunted in that growth pretty early because of, I mean, so many reasons that there's a lot of shame and embarrassment and humiliation about uh, sexual desires that, that feel new. Because I do believe that we are meant to sexually evolve progressively all throughout the lifespan. And, and there's so many things that can happen in life that get in the way of us being able to explore that. Because again, our sexuality is such a powerful part of who we are. And so I think we get afraid, we get scared by stepping into something that powerful because we're concerned it, it can and it will consume us because it does have that possibility. And I've seen that happen before where people will throw themselves too hard and heavy into their sexual identity and then they'll disappear. Uh, but I think to do something yet again, if you respect the body and you, you explore things gradually and understand your own comfort level with things, then from there, it can become a more and more powerful experience. Um, I also think that I would love for people to learn how to be able to feel the experience of not just fear, but terror in their bodies, to feel that that surge and that, that clamping down, that heart-stopping, nauseating sensation of terror in their bodies and to be able to breathe through it. Because once you harness the energy of that terror, you become unstoppable. You can do pretty much anything in your life. But that terror itself is such a big and overwhelming thing that we often clamp down, we clamp our nervous systems down at the experience of that sensation so that it doesn't go all the way through us. And it ends up causing more harm than that, than when we do that. Because it's all this energy that wants to be utilized for something that can be healing, but when it gets shut down, then it can cause imbalance. And, and again, it manifests all kinds of illness uh, from, from psychological, emotional to physical. And so to learn how to be present with that sensation of terror and own it, I think is one of the most empowering things a person can do. Uh, and I suppose the last thing, and maybe this should be the first thing, but it's just the last thing that comes to mind, is to also know, I would love for people to know 
what it feels like to experience a rapturous sense of whole love in their bodies, because then it translates to all sensory experiences. Everything else comes alive from eating to sleeping to, to sex to just to just an emotional connection with people. When you know what that that physical sensation feels like in your body, you want to experience it all the time and with everything that you do. And so it, be, it, it adds this flavor to everything that we do. And it's just this rich, embodied, sensual mm-hmm. experience of life. And it mm-hmm. just is so much fun. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I live in North Idaho. I live and work in North Idaho. And there's a lot about this culture that I really love because I was born and raised here. But they have a tendency here culturally to just suck the joy out of everything. Oh, uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> yes. No. Well, we eat a lot of potatoes here. And, yes, it's, you know, it's yes. just a sense of, you know, <laughs> something that has some base nutrition to it. But mostly yeah. it's, there's not a whole lot to it. And mm. so within the culture that I was I've, was raised in, there's just this absence of vibrancy, absence of body and and some kind of a deep pride in living uh, in a survival state of being all the time. And and I don't like it. <laughs> I don't <laughs> agree with it. Yes. And that, and that <laughs> once, because they're because the, people in my, com- my community, they really enjoy me. No, but they I also kind imagine. of get me a little cross-eyed because they don't know what to do with me because oh. I just love people. I just yeah. bow and I hug people and I'm I'm sensual in my sense of presence while yeah. also being respectful of boundaries. But they're kind of like, what the heck, lady? Like, who are you? Yes. And but it's just uh. I'm just so alive with this the sense of love and and it's so much fun to share it with people. What's difficult is when other people aren't able to receive it fully because there's something about that energy that feels so threatening to them because they've been starving for it for so long that they can only take little sips of it at a time. Mm, but I'm just yeah. so ready to get <laughs> it. I'm like take it, take. It. I love everybody, and I do. I really do love everybody. <laughs> Um, uh-huh. so that's where I also feel just this, uh-huh. a deep sense of calling to be in this community and to learn how to be patient mm-hmm. and continue to love people well, um, because my, my presence isn't always received well and, and that's okay. That's okay. It's a time and a place sort of thing. Mm, yes. Yeah, you're such a gift, Christy. <laughs> I mean, you're just an amazing gift to humanity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, you're so sweet. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for embracing that um, because that's a lot <laughs> yeah, even mm. for you why, as a human, but then also receiving that, accepting that and then passing that on. It's a different story. Mm. So Thank you. Thank you so much for being you again. Um, Wow, I wish I could just stay a little bit more. But for now, conversation will end here. But before we go, where is the best place to find more information about you, Kristen? Uh, So let's see. So I do have a website. And it is, I have to pull it up because it's not the easiest website. It isn't. So it's a it's a platform. Uh, that I use for telecommunication and it's sacred-soul.clientsecure.me. And so, so again, that's sacred-soul.clientsecure, that's one word, dot M-E. You can also Google me. So my first name, Kristen, K-R-I-S-T-I-N, and then my last name, Opris, O-P-R-I-S. And that might be the easiest way to find me, just to find me on, on LinkedIn and then from there be able to connect with me. So I'm slowly connecting with people more on the internet in a way that's more accessible. Um, I've always been a very private person. And so to put myself out there is, is a bit new for me. And so, but it's the type of thing that I, that the kind of clients that I'm getting are the ones that really want to work with me. And so I imagine I'll become more accessible over time as, as I get more comfortable with that experience of putting myself out there. But, but that I suppose probably is the easiest way to get a hold of me. Wonderful. And I'll have that link. It will be easy to uh, click on it because it will be highlighted, hyperlinked. So I'll have oh, that. Thank, on you. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. So you have a wonderful time with your beautiful self for now. And we'll talk soon. We'll be in touch again, Kristen. All right. Thank Bye you. For now. Bye. Thank you for listening. To learn more about Kristen Opris and her work, please visit 
sacred-soul.clientsecure.me. To learn more about this podcast, please visit fitforjoy.org slash podcast. Thank you again for listening and bye for now.